Hello and welcome to today's webinar entitled Building a Single Technology Platform for Real-Time and Iterative Analytics on Fast and Big Data. My name is Peter Viskew, so I'll be the moderator for today's event. Uh, before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. Um, as we go through the presentation, there's usually a slight delay when we move between slides. might take a second or two. Uh, we expect the presentation is going to last about 45 minutes. Um, and I uh, do want to let everybody know that if you're registered for the webinar, you'll be receiving an archived version of the presentation within a few days, and uh, all registrants will, will get that email with a link to the replay. We do encourage questions. Uh, in order to submit a question, please use the On24 um, Q&A tab, which is located at the bottom of your screen. At any time during the presentation, uh, feel free to type in your questions and we'll respond to those um, uh, after the webinar. Now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. We have with us Pratik Kapadia, C Flight Tech, uh, Technology Roadmap, with a special focus on R&D and IP creation and protection. He has 15 years experience across mobile network and application innovation, wireless data network management, and cryptography applications. In his last appointment with the Center for Excellence in Telecom at IIT Bombay, Pratik contributed to the IEEE 802.16M standard and co-invented a mobile social network ap application platform. Previously, Pratik held a technology lead position for the packet data services at Reliance Communications and developed crypt cryptographic software at Algorithmic Research Limited in Israel. Also with us today is Ryan Betts, CTO at VoltDB. Ryan was one of the initial developers of VoltDB's commercial products, and he really values his opportunity to collaborate with customers, partners, and prospects to understand their data management needs and help them realize the business value of VoltDB and related technologies. Just a quick overview of VoltDB. Ryan, for, for those of you not familiar with Volt, uh, VoltDB was co-founded by Mike Stonebreaker. Mike is the uh, 2014 recipient of the ACM Turing Award, an award many people refer to as the Nobel Prize of Computer Science. So we're very proud of Mike and uh, his accomplishments there. Um, he's received that award for his many accomplishments over the years and many of the companies and innovations that he's enabled going back to his uh, days at Berkeley where uh, Ingress was formed. With respect to VoltDB, VoltDB is an in-memory uh, database, uh, in-memory technology, but data is durable to disk, never lost. It's a scale-out, shared-nothing architecture. It is reliable and fault-tolerant. We support a SQL and uh, Java uh, JSON interface uh, with ACID uh, guarantees. Um, we have integrations with Hadoop and data warehouse uh, platforms from many companies. Uh, VoltDB is also open source, is an open source version available on GitHub. Um, VoltDB is very fast. We have run the um, YCSB benchmark, that's the Yahoo Cloud Services benchmark, and established, uh, as far as we know, it is the world record for running that benchmark in the cloud, showing up to 2.4 million transactions per second. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan uh, in just a second. Just agenda, Ryan's going to talk about fast and big data, uh, the ecosystem and architecture. Then we're going to have Pratik from Flytex come on and talk about an analytics use case with fast and big data, talk about co some case studies, and uh, then we'll uh, end the webinar. Okay, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan Betts. Thank you, Peter. Right, so. Big data is obviously a hot topic these days. You know it's a hot topic when one of the Sunday editorials in the New York Times is all about deriving value from big data. Uh, at VoltDB, we work with a lot of customers, and we see a common cycle as they explore and learn how to use data to improve their enterprise and to improve the customer experience that they can offer. And that process usually goes through a four-step cycle. At first, they need to begin to collect the information. They collect the data that's of interest to them, and then they begin exploring it. Both of these can actually be surprisingly difficult when you're working with data that's either high velocity or large volume. However, at some point, there's a result from that exploration, either a discovery, 
some kind of one-term or one-time insight, a scientific result, uh, some model that informs long-term capacity planning, or a set of optimizations, a model that can be derived that you can then use in real time to improve customer experience, to uh, create real-time activities on a per-customer segment basis. Another way to look at this as you go through this cycle is you need to accommodate both fast data and big data. Collecting and acting in real time is a fast data application. The challenges to solve that problem are challenges of velocity, how quickly data is arriving and how quickly you can respond using the model from your analytics stack in real time. The exploration and analysis phases are often big data problems. Here it's about managing a large volume of data and making that large corpus of information explorable and, uh, and analyzable, often using tools like Hadoop. When you look at the tool set that you need to organize to solve both the velocity and the volume components, we think that it makes sense to separate your architecture into explicit fast and big components. On the big data side are technologies that I think we're a little more familiar with, technologies like HDFS, OLAP reporting, SQL on Hadoop, um, sometimes machine learning libraries that can run against a number of different large volume big data backends, and batch analytics techniques like MapReduce. The fast data side is still more of an emerging technology, and I think this makes sense. If you think about the life cycle that organizations go through, first they need to be able to collect, explore, and analyze data before they can begin supporting the real-time applications that constitute action against that information model and real-time context. On the fast data side, it's important to have an application stack that can combine real-time analytics with the performance to ingest high-velocity data and the ability to make per-event decisions that combine the contextual analytics from the real-time stack with the model and predictive analytics from the back-end stack along with the current event to make an optimized choice, to personalize an experience, to optimize access to a resource, or to perform high-speed, very narrow authorization and policy decisions. The combination and the combined value of velocity and volume is becoming widely recognized. For example, Gartner has reported that 89% of marketers surveyed plan to, complete, to compete primarily on the basis of customer experience. When we think about modern customer experience, what we're really thinking about is a new wave of systems of engagement. Applications that interact with customers dependent upon their location, their immediate preferences, and the actions they just took. This requires the combination of both velocity and volume, uh, and Pratik, in a moment, is going to walk through a brilliant example of a technology stack that accomplishes just that with really interesting and impactful business results. When we look at the applications that people are building, we can look at them from the point of view of customer experience, systems of engagement. We can also look at them from the macro technology drivers that are behind them. It's no secret that mobile and Internet of Things technologies are driving whole new ways of interacting with both people, places, and events. One of my coworkers came into the office this morning with his new Apple Watch telling me that he has an application that gives him to-the-minute weather reports. It'll tap or give a little haptic signal 10 minutes before it starts to rain, a perfect example of both large data analytics along with real-time localized customer interaction. So we think of a fast data pipeline to solve the velocity problem in front of your large volume applications. And that fast data pipeline needs to be able to combine a few key activities. It needs to be able to ingest, analyze, export, meaning create data pipelines that connect high velocity to high volume, and then conduct per event decisions. Oftentimes, the data that's arriving to this pipeline is streaming in nature. We're seeing real-time data from devices, from sensors, and from mobile networks that need to be processed in real time by the Velocity stack. There are, we see applications structured against these high-velocity, fast data pipelines, and I'm just going to quickly walk through these three patterns. The first is streaming real-time analytics. In this case, 
some amount of event data often arriving through a queue or from some other collection point is being analyzed in real time. It's being presented to the FAST data stack for real time aggregation and summary, oftentimes to manage key performance indicators, drive internal dashboards, or make operational analytics against high velocity feeds available for transparent operational reasons. In this case, the data is arriving at the FAST data platform where it's being summarized and analyzed and then made available to other applications and downstream users. It's interesting to look at streaming data and to think about streaming from the point of view of what needs to be done to the data as it arrives. How does streaming data combine computation and data within a platform? When you look at streaming operators, streaming operators typically require some out of state. If you want to filter data, you usually need to maintain a context that informs the filter. Oftentimes, filters are dynamic and based upon what was just witnessed. Joining data obviously requires two pieces of state that can be combined together. And aggregations are, of course, another aspect of state. If you're maintaining an aggregation, you're maintaining a summary of the data that's been seen to date. That is stateful. And then you're also maintaining the actual result of that aggregation. You're maintaining the data that results from the analytics that have been done and making that data queryable by other applications. Really, the only part of streaming that is stateless is the partitioning of incoming data across a cloud of processors. Otherwise, it's important to be able to combine a stateful database that offers a real-time analytics query engine along with the capability of processing per-event data at streaming speeds. So what do these analytics look like? Well, the analytics usually involve combining some amount of metadata or dimension data to enrich the events that are arriving with a large fact table or moving window of data that represents the current context in combination with real-time streaming aggregations, either built directly from SQL or through declarative definitions of materialized views. Combining these capabilities into a single scale-out and memory transactional database allows you to conduct per event decisions combined with real-time analytics in a single platform without the necessary requirements or without the need to combine lots of disparate tools together into a complex operational workflow. Of data in real time, often there's some kind of a pipeline activity. In many cases, the data that's being ingested, analyzed, and decisioned against by the high-velocity platform also needs to be enriched and captured or frozen into an OLAP store for future big data analytics. In many cases, fast data applications present a transformation challenge. The data that's arriving is often not complete. It often needs to be sessionized, combined with other data, chopped into logical business processes, or sometimes filtered in the case of devices or data from devices that present redundant information. So for example, if I am tracking real-time location of inventory, I don't want to record all of the different times that a piece of inventory was in the same location. Rather, I'd like to create a record anytime something moves. That requires a real-time transformation process against the incoming sensor state. Being able to combine the stateful and analytical capabilities of a high-velocity platform together with the ability to create pipelines of streaming data from the high-velocity point to the volume or to the long-term collection point means that you can avoid expensive I.O. intensive and latency intensive batch operations to conduct these transformations. So conducting these transformations in real time in a streaming nature is an important component of high velocity data feeds. The ability to build pipelines and can export data in CSV or TSV formats and Avro formats or as raw data. And we can build pipeline time high velocity component to back end systems such as Kafka, RabbitMQ, Hadoop. This enables the creation of interesting applications that use the high velocity capabilities of VoltDB to do real time decisioning, alerting, and alarming, sending those alerts and alarms to downstream queues like Kafka and RabbitMQ, where downstream applications can pick up those events and drive an action. It also means that you can use VoltDB to do real-time transformation of incoming streaming data, for example, sessionization, and then send that sessionized data to Hadoop where it can be essentially made immutable or frozen for long-term analytics. 
I'm going to pass the presentation now to Pratik, who's a concrete example of a platform that combines high-velocity applications with large volume applications uh, in a mobile environment. So, Pratik. Thank you, Peter. And we have seen that uh, Ryan that talking us through the, the technology that, uh, that in, and the segregation of fast and big data and why it needs to happen and exactly what goes in. Uh, what I will uh, show you is, is a few solutions that Flytex builds, uh, which are mixed fast and big data solutions, and a few use cases from uh, from from the marketing case use cases in uh, for mobile service operators. Before I I begin, uh, just a quick uh, summary of what Flytex does as a company. Uh, Flytex it creates measurable economic value for communication service providers through big data analytics. Uh, we are a Dutch company uh, with of offices uh, globally. And we partner with uh, with with brands that are uh, that are that are mobile enterprises, uh, mobile service operators, and technology partners such as OTV. To see the fast data and big data in action, uh, we, we I'll just take you through a, a few blocks in in the. Uh, the fast data and big data combined solution architecture uh, from Flytext. So the the blocks are uh, are the real time trigger engine and the rendering engine. And the blocks below are the continuous insight engine. So in 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 brief, the 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 blocks above represent the fast data path for data. So you see the streaming data from your different data sources uh, going in uh, to your real time to the, to the Flytex real time real uh, trigger engine, and below that you see the other block, the continuous insight engine, where uh, batch inputs like files, uh, business intelligence system inputs, application inputs through uh, to other databases come in, and the uh, the com combination of fast data and big data happens in what we call the rendering engine. The rendering engine has uh, ha has got uh, is, is primarily a rule engine which has triggered rules and scheduled rules. So scheduled rules maybe okay uh, maybe generate a report uh, every hour of. The, the 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 most visited websites by 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 my subscribers. Uh, the triggered rule would be if a subscriber does an interesting action, and that subscriber uh, is is a subscriber of interest, then a contextual offer needs to need to be given to the subscriber. So uh, very briefly, if you look at uh, where these are, uh, where these these combinations are uh, are are enabled is 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 in the path from trigger to to in the persistent store. So that could be a data lake, it could be a data warehouse, um, primarily built on HBase. Uh, we move on to the block below, which is the continuous insight engine. This is this is the, the long term analytics, which will which will have a few days, a few weeks of history of subscribers, and there are primarily two types of analytics processes we we see today. Uh, one is iterative analytics, and one is uh, batch analytics. So, how 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 I make the distinction is. Uh, Imagine a data scientist uh, in the modern world. The data scientist's uh, biggest uh, or, or the first problem the data science scientist faces is he is moving data and moving data to the cloud, moving data to uh, to between clouds is 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 an unnecessary overhead 
because it is only the first step to analytics process. The next step happens when when, when you add a, a, a machine learning or a data mining algorithm over the data that you have acquired. So iterative analytics helps uh, uh, helps the data scientist to experiment with data quickly before arriving at the correct algorithm that will build subscribers persona or that will detect uh, and and record trends in a, in a subscriber's behavior. Uh, once the data scientist has done a few iterations with the iterative analytics engine, the uh, a final should I say copy of code for the for the learning algorithm or the mining algorithm goes to what we call the batch analytics cluster, and thus the batch analytics cluster is what feeds the the the, the, the persistent store with the KPI or the insight or the recommendation actions and rules for a subscriber. So let's see now a use case of pure big data analytics. Uh, so here I have a use case which is uh, product recommendations. So it could be product recommendations for uh, uh, for a mobile commerce portal, it could be for product recommendations for uh, uh, for prepay markets where there are there are multiple prepay bundles available. The, the common theme in these algorithms is uh, what we call collaborative filtering, and in collaborative filtering, the the user, the subscriber, is modeled, and and the product is modeled as as a vector set. So you, you will see the bubble above, uh, where the product utility and the, the subscriber's usage is measured and set into a model, which builds mo the product rankings for subscribers as uh, as possible product recommendations. Now this model uh, is what is what is what is run in the batch analytics engine, and its outcomes which are product recommendations for individual subscribers in multiple contexts are, are then stored as recommendation vectors, that is recommendation offers on the persistent store. So then once these are stored, then you can have multiple use cases. You can have use cases uh, uh, which, which, uh, which, are, which, which are the send out these offers or which wait for subscriber input to respond with an offer. So one such product recommendation use case uh, is, is in my case study here. So here you see these are these are prepay products. So it's it's a prepay market, uh, a large operator uh, operating in many regions in the market, and. Uh, the, the, what the graphs attempt to show is the difference between uh, a, a rule-based campaign for making offers uh, and a machine-learned recommendation offer. Uh, so you will see very, on, the, on the graph, on the graphic above, you see different offers. The blue band indicates the offers uh, successfully accepted by uh, the, the, the subscriber in a rule-based campaign and the, for the same offer, when it is made to subscribers based on the machine learned product recommendations, you see a higher bar indicating the conversion ratios are higher. In the bar below, you see that uh, same stats, but differentiated by different regions. So, so you see there are some uh, very few regions where the human recommended offer actually is better than the machine recommended offer, which means there is a scope for the machine to improve. Uh, to the right, you see uh, the different kind of personas uh, that, that, we, that could be used in the recommendation. So there could be uh, one recommendation for a, for a uh, high high value subscriber, one for a medium value subscriber, 
uh, a recommendation for a early adopter of a plan. Uh, similarly, you could have a distinction made based on offer objectives. Is it a cross-sell offer? Is it an upsell offer? And the offer itself, of course. So this is this is this is, this is the use case. I move on to an iterative analytics use case, uh, that of micro segmentation. So, so basically, subscribers are. Um, uh, let's say we are, we are dealing with a 10 million subscriber network. Each each subscriber is obviously different, but when we when we want to treat them uh, uh, as separate marketing segments, these segments need to be discovered. So typically. The, the discovery will happen uh, experimentally because you don't know in, in advance, for example, where uh, if I want to distinguish between uh, between uh, high value subscribers and the, the medium value subscribers, you will not know where the value boundaries are until the data scientist finds the boundary by experimentation. So this is this is a great case for iterative analytics. Uh, what I what I've shown above is 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 the uh, different clustering algorithm. So basically, you have soft clustering or hard clustering. If you have hard clustering, your limits are uh, are uh, are uh, are a hard number, which means anything below uh, the boundary is certainly. Uh, in one segment, and anything above the boundary is certainly in another segment. Uh, most sophisticated models are are soft cluster models where uh, the boundaries have got confidence measures about uh, about the likelihood of belonging belonging to one segment or the other. So uh, near the near the boundary uh, center, you will have an equal confidence score in both boundaries. This, these, these, these soft clusters are, are useful in marketing when you, 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 you want to have flexible segmentation uh, and, and, and only one segmentation process running, but many use cases for the same segmentation process. So when it, an example of that is the uh, Lossian mixture model, uh, which Flytex recently uh, contributed to, to the ML and, and Spark. Uh, so in this uh, iterative case, the, the, the data scientist discovers where the boundaries are. It could be, of course, it could be a multidimensional problem, which means uh, more samples and, and more data for the, for the, for the uh, data scientist to deal with. So imagine you have, you have uh, 10 million subscribers with about 100 million data points uh, in, uh, in 20 dimensions. Extracting this data, running uh, um, a purely Hadoop-based uh, bad job uh, would take anything from a few few hours to to, to, to a couple of days. Uh, imagine a data scientist who needs to do this uh, a few times before he gets to the right segment definition. Uh, so the, the 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 difficulty is solved by placing the iterative analytics cluster right where the data ingestion is happening. So that even though this is not a production production cluster, the data scientists can can experiment with production data when and as I said earlier, when he arrives at the right uh, right algorithm or the right Parameters for the algorithm, then we will get moved to the big data stack. So, it, so this is a, a really um, an exciting use case for me, where the data scientist can can actually very quickly turn around uh, his or her work into a productionized analytics use case. We, now we see the, the use case where uh, 
real time analytics is supplemented by big data as well as iterative analytics so um what you see in this in in this diagram is you have a different types of triggers coming out of the real time analytics processing engine yes and iterative analytics and big data analytics output going into the uh, the uh, persistence store that is your lake or your warehouse and you have certain um long term subscriber uh, insights like behaviors uh, preferences recommendations being fed to a root engine so let let's imagine that there is there is a there is a there is a prepaid subscriber and uh, prepaid subscriber has um has crossed a, a certain threshold in in his in his uh, in his daily balance so uh in prepaid markets this is this is very common uh, a prepaid subscriber makes a, a few more calls or a, a few longer calls than usual uh the balance drops and then this is the right time to to target that subscriber because that subscriber is likely to want to to uh, to upgrade his uh, prepaid product or his prepaid balance at uh, at the time when the balance is going low but you want to do this for a subscriber who is not regularly showing this behavior because subscribers can can beat the system they can they they can do this once every week so that they get they get a a, a nice promotion um so you want you want to discover behaviors of subscribers you want to say which are the subscribers who are, who are valid for low balance threshold um uh, the triggers so imagine that i am i am that subscriber and while i am while i am talking to you my my balance threshold has gone low um i my behavior is is such that this is a not a normal event for me as soon as the, the balance drops below a threshold the, there is an event which is coming in from the uh, uh, from the from the telco network to the to the flight deck system this gets translated to a trigger which means the event gets passed and then interesting information gets pulled out uh, balance gets converted to write out to p and a trigger rule gets fired the trigger rule will validate further whether the subscriber behavior matches the pattern that it thinks looked for and a real time action follows so this is 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 a case where there is a bundle real time and big data together now while we are learning subscriber behaviors the algorithm may not be the first time the parameters may not be right the first time so iterative analytics is required for the data scientist as a uh, as a set before to arrive at the right description of behavior and then merge with the big data analytics a uh, stack so that this gets persisted as a subscriber behavior so so now let's see a specific case study of real time the micro segmented offers uh so the, let, let's say that the objective is for uh, for the telco to improve customer engagement for increasing uh, the arpu the arpu arpu in in um in telco lingo is average revenue per user and the data to be analyzed is the customers usage history uh arpu charts for the for the telco 
a spend pattern for the subscriber, preferences of the subscriber. So the kind of solution that Flytex builds is build a marketing program which is based on the on these these data to to discover the the, the behavior and to micro segment based on these behaviors um, and to set tripwires on specific context to, to, to determine the right context when the subscriber should be targeted. So you see that the ARPU is segmented using what what we would uh, what what we what we called earlier as soft clustering or hard clustering using a Gaussian mixture model or some uh, some like something like K-means clustering. Now, once these clusters are built, for, for each cluster, we can define what trigger is interesting. So, if the subscriber shows product affinity to a specific product and uh, a particular leg of usage, that is maybe long distance calling, is is dominant is the dominant leg, then when there is drop in usage in that dominant leg, the subscriber should be triggered with an offer. So this this case very really I, I thought pulls everything together and it shows the, the, the power of using a fast data with big data. Uh, so these this is a this is a solution that Flytex has deployed in uh, in a real market. Uh, where we see a 2% month-on-month increase in revenue, which means um, if the user base is constant, then 2% increase in ARPU. And similarly, there is a there is a yearly impact on on subscriber on on telco revenues as well as the the minutes of usage, which means the telco the network is getting used more. Thank you everyone for listening and uh, we are opening the questions. Thank you, Pratik. Thanks, terrific presentation. Uh, a great example, as Ryan said at the beginning, you know, this is really a, a representative of a new wave of systems of engagement. I think Pratik uh, took you through a terrific explanation of the combination of fast and big data. Um, how you build applications on real-time streaming data. Um, at VoltDB, we, we like to say that streaming applications are really database applications when you have a database that's fast enough. From our perspective, the Flytext um, solution really showcases VoltDB's capabilities. Um, and it's not just technical. Pr uh, Pratik did a great job talking about the, the direct business value uh, that's enabled with real-time capability. As we said earlier, if you have questions, type them into the chat window in the ON24 uh, screen. Uh, we'll reply back to you on those. Um, another option, if you like, you can send uh, an email to askanengineer at VoltDB. We're happy to take questions that way. If you'd like to learn more about Flytext, you can see their um, web URL there on the window, and same with VoltDB. Uh, we'd encourage you to test VoltDB try out our Enterprise Edition. Uh, you can download it right off the website. You can try VoltDB in the cloud. It's available with Amazon's cloud formation. Uh, and if you like, you can try the open source version, which is available on GitHub. And with that, uh, we're going to draw to an end for attendance today and look forward to talking to you in the future.